All right. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or wherever you are. Uh, thank you for joining me today. My name is Yusri Muhammad. I work for Telstra Purple. And I'm here today to talk you uh, through a journey of tips and tricks for developing uh, efficient big data applications and operating them as well. So I switch to my presentation. So initially, two seconds about myself. Originally from Egypt, hence uh, the funny accent. And then now an Australian citizen. I started with Redify a few years ago. And then Redify has been acquired by Telstra. And then last year, uh, a few entities inside Telstra combined into a new brand called, called uh, Telstra Purple. And you can imagine that at Telstra, we have more than a few data sets to handle. So for the last two years, I was working with um, a bunch of big data applications and pipelines. And I've got uh, some experience and knowledge, and I'd like to share that with you. But before sharing the details, I'd like to give you a brief uh, background on big data applications. I'm assuming that most of you might be aware of that, but just a, a quick uh, reminder. So initially, it was Google around uh, 1998 uh, being founded. And then Google needed to index the internet and process uh, massive amounts of data. So they inv invented MapReduce plus a bunch of other algorithms as well. And this triggered the introduction of Hadoop platform. And around 2012, uh, a new resource manager was introduced in Hadoop to make things uh, much more reliable. But Hadoop still was a bit slow. So Spark has been invented uh, to do stuff more in memory and make things fast. And the uh, 2.0 version of Spark has been uh, introduced such that uh, people with uh, SQL knowledge can interact with the application and uh, use it without the need to learn stuff like Java or Scala. And then a few months ago, we have uh, version 3.0, which, which is more about operating in environments like Kubernetes and so on. So uh, most of my demos today and uh, examples and so on, and the whole, inter sorry, whole conversation will be around Hadoop and Spark and this kind of tools uh, or ecosystem. I'm assuming that you might have um, some sort of experience or knowledge uh, about it. But yeah, even, even, if, even, even if not, most of the stuff you will see today would be very, very general and can be applied in many, many other tools, uh, stuff like Azure Synapse Analytics, all right? So the agenda for today is very uh, kind of high level here, uh, six themes. The first one will be around storage, and then we'll have a look on file systems used to uh, manage and operate data for big data applications. And then we'll have a look about uh, on skewness and data quality, and we'll wrap up with a quick uh, overview about governance and uh, some tooling ideas. All right, let's dig in into the first high level tip. Cool. So initially, big data. The first V of big data application is normally volume, storage. So um, you need first to understand your storage format. Most of the big data applications, you will find that we use two um, columnar format, two common ones, uh, ORC and Parquet. And you need to understand the schema of your data set and uh, how it works with that storage format. You need to understand, I mean, or read the schema or the specs of the storage format and understand if how an integer or a string, a string or whatever is stored in such a storage format. And then uh, when you see the outcome of your big data pipelines, you might need to think, okay, is it just generating too much data? Can I uh, optimize it a little bit? So you might need to experiment until you find an equilibrium between uh, optimizing the storage uh, costs and also making uh, compute fast because the less data you store, the generally speaking, the faster your compute will be. All right, so let's go to the demo. I'm quick here for the slide, but we'll have too many demos. All right, so our first de demo here will be around storage and it will be mainly about creating a data frame, think about it, a data frame or a table or something like that, and uh, persisting it to disk. And every now and uh, every step, we'll add a column or modify a column type or something like that, and then uh, measure the amount of storage consumed and see what will work better. All right. So I'm running now uh, VS Code connected to uh, WSL2 on Windows. So I'll 
start partial, feed it, or actually I need to go into my demo folder first, pro shell, input, and demo. Wait for the shell. Oops, demo, scan. Okay, so initially, we'll create a data frame of 10 million rows, and it will contain by default this kind of API will create an, a data frame with a single uh, integer or long column. All right, and then we'll persist it to desk and see uh, how much storage do we need here. So this one is still kind of, yep, kicking off. So to create a 10 million uh, record data frame, it will take, it will need 200K. Okay, fine, cool. Uh, by the way, most of this kind of uh, columnar data format uh, formats, they have a built-in compression. So yeah, you can have 10 million records in 200K. Let's assume that we'll need to add another string column and the string column will contain a prefix and suffix and some random number in the range from zero to or one to million, whatever. So I'll hit enter to create, to run the next snippet here. So you can see here the sample data for the next example, which is an, an ID or sequence number and the string column in this kind of format, you can see it's a random number in the range of uh, zero to million. And boom, we increased, increased into like what, 71 megabytes of data needed. Yeah, that's too much. I mean, going from 200K to 71 megs is a bit too much. Anyway, let's go to the next step. And for this step, I change the cardinality of that string column to be just 10 unique values, okay? So if you can see here, uh, we have set the ID, we have a string column, but uh, the number of unique combinations of the string column is uh, much, much more smaller now. And you can see here that when we have less cardinality, uh, the amount of data needed to store the array is uh, like what, 100, uh, 20 times smaller or something like that. Different. Okay, so to understand why, why this is happening, and if you read the uh, specs of ORC or Parquet data, data formats, you'll understand that strings are stored as dictionaries, and the individual value of each string is just an index into that dictionary. So uh, the less the cardinality, less the data or the less storage you will need. Okay, let's go into the next one, which will be about what happened if we, the, that string size, is double, like I'll double the prefix and suffix, but it'll, it will still have the same uh, specs. So if we're talking about dictionaries, then probably even if we double the size of the string itself, should, should it matter much? So we still need 5.2 megabytes to store the array, which is good, all right? So actually for strings, as long as uh, the cardinality is uh, a bit low, then you don't need to worry about that. What about constant data or columns? Assuming that you would like to put a, a version or some piece of metadata, metadata or whatever. So hit this one and let's see what will happen. So still the same, but we are adding a constant string and a constant decimal here. Yeah, increased a little bit from five to roughly nine, but it's mainly about um, uh, metadata and overhead inside the file itself. So the increase is really uh, marginal here. All right, so next, I'll hit enter first before I explain this one because it will take a minute or something. So next step, assume that we have stuff like uh, complex data types, an array or um, a struct or something like that. So here I'm adding an, an array, array column. The column will contain an array of numbers, 100 elements, and every one of them will be uh, a random number. But as you know, as long as you are using this kind of uh, pseudo random number generators, it depends on the seed. So if you have a seed uh, with 10,000 unique combinations, then the elements of the array will have 10, 000, sorry, 1,000 unique combinations of the array elements. So you can imagine now that it's taking uh, more time now to persist the new data frame containing all the previous stuff along with, yay, done. Uh, along with the new array column. And you can see here that we went from nine megabytes to 974. It's like uh, two orders of magnitude. Okay, so the most important thing to remember here is that normally for 
um, but nest, uh, complex types like arrays or structs or whatever, they will not be optimized well, even if uh, you have something like um, uh, 10, uh, 1,000 unique combinations of the array elements. I mean, eventually they will consume too much uh, storage. So we went from uh, 9 to 974. But can we do anything about it? I mean, it happened to us practic practically in one of the data sets. It was like what? Consuming too much storage and making other pipelines very slow. And then we started to investigate and see if we can, yeah, I mean, limit that uh, storage explosion. So uh, the trick here, if you understand or you have noticed the idea around the string dictionaries, is that, yeah, why, why to store it as an array? Can we store it as a string? Yes, we can. So if you can come here, and especially if we have low cardinality, not too many unique combinations. So let's store it as a, a comma separated uh, string. So instead of an array, you can see here it is an array. It will be a comma separated value. Or you can store if it is a more complex type, you can store it as a JSON string or uh, base 64 or whatever. So I'll hit enter to run the next uh, snippet. And this snippet will do the same. We still have the array uh, column, but this time we'll store it as a string. And if you remember, strings are stored as dictionaries. And as long as we don't have too many combinations, yeah, uh, storage will be very, very minimal. All right, let's have a look on the impact now. Takes also some time to yeah to resist the data, but I'm not sure if we have some sort of drum roll effect here. Nearly there, excitement. Okay, boom, done. All right, it went back to almost the previous uh, kind of size range. So we don't have to store 974 megabytes. We we need only to store 13 megabytes, even if we still have uh, that that kind of uh, what integer array, every element of them is like what, or every record has uh, 10 ele uh, 100 elements, all right? So this is um, one of the core ideas around how to optimize the storage. And uh, practically speaking, this kind of saved us around 90% uh, of, of a storage for a certain data set and make, made also uh, subsequent pipelines uh, much more faster. So once you understand, just to recap here, I'll go to back to the presentation. The takeaway here, if you understand uh, the schema of your um, underlying storage format, you understand the data type, cardinality, and don't store uh, data that you don't need and so on, probably you will achieve um, very good uh, storage uh, size, which will make also your uh, subsequent jobs or pipelines run faster. Because it's not about uh, storing as much data as you need. It's about storing uh, them efficiently to make things uh, running faster. All right, so that was good. First uh, demo done and dusted. So next one, it's more about file system. It's somehow related to storage, but yeah, still near the file system uh, area. So most of the big data applications, normally in Hadoop environment or similar, we use a distributed file system. And then you need to understand if it is an object store like Azure Blob Storage or a proper, proper distributed file system like uh, something like Azure Data Lake. Okay, because that will make difference. And also, you need to like what pick as um, pick from different access methods. Sometimes you can access a certain folder uh, using a local uh, uh, URL or something or a network 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 URL, and that will make a difference in the performance in your of your jobs. And you'll have a look on that. But eventually, uh, most of big data applications uh, we we store data in partitions. Most of the time, it will be uh, date-based part partitions. So if you have a, a very deep partitioning scheme, you, some of your queries will be somehow slow due to uh, the overhead of enumerating uh, file system folders, but you can add a, a bit of metadata to Hadoop environment, specifically to a tool called Hive, to make such queries fast. And let's have a look. So I'll close this one. Exit the last demo and switch to the next one. So what I have here, I have here two data sets. Uh, or they are actually identical, some um, dummy data actually, and it is stored into, oops, uh, a year, month, day uh, kind of uh, partition scheme. 
can show you a quick where is that okay you can think about it I, I think most of you might have seen that before uh, this kind of year and month and day and and so on okay so this dummy data is stored twice once in uh, inside my my what uh, my linux vm and once in the windows uh, machine or file system so just to give you an idea about open another shell here about the difference in performance so i'll just try to print the size of each individual month folder this is um, my linux vm or wsl very quick okay every folder contains like 17 megs and what about the windows one i'm accessing the windows file system from inside my wsl now okay and it contains the same identical data okay i think you can feel it now so takes a little bit more time. So the same concept applies, uh, especially if you are accessing uh, slow file systems or if your na name node on your Hadoop environment is um, under heavy load, all right? So let's go back to our screen here and I'll run, I read from my Linux file system and filter for a certain year, a month and day or day range actually, and count how many records I have. Nothing very complicated here. This one, just like what Spark will need to bootstrap, but eventually should finish. Yeah, now, okay. So it takes like a second or two for just bootstrapping Spark. And the access uh, using the Linux file system was fast. Let's have a look if we need to access the same data from the, um, that kind of mount file system format thing from the Windows file system. Okay, this one should be slow, should be really much slow than the other one. Because yeah, enumerating folders and files or whatever from the a slower file system will make your jobs run slower. All right. So should take time, but eventually maybe we can go to the browser meanwhile and I'll show you another thing. There's the Spark history thing. I think both have finished. The first one was like what one second, the second one. Actually, the duration-wise, duration, duration wise, this one was like 30 seconds, but Spark does not choose that. And sometimes you will be mis misled because in Spark history, your job seems to be running fast, but actually, duration-wise, this, this took like 30 seconds or one minute, okay? So how to handle such thing, as, as thing assuming that you would like to work against, against this file system? Cool, there are some tweaks in Spark and different tools such that you can eliminate the idea of what, of enumerating file system folders. So you are just helping Spark and giving it a hint about which folders contain your data. And yeah, this is much faster, okay? But this is clunky. No one would like to write a code, a code piece like that. And yeah, too many, uh, too many lines. Anyway, so uh, most of big data applications will have uh, a tool or a product called Hive, something like what SQL over uh, big data files. So you can create an external table over the same uh, folder structure or uh, path. You can partition it by the same partition stuff, year, a month, and day. Uh, this kind of snippet will create something like what metadata behind the scenes inside Hive. Let me run it because it takes a second or so. So the idea here is similar to the idea of optimizing uh, relational queries. If you have a slow query, you will go and create an index and then the query will be faster, okay? So similarly here, we are creating uh, a little bit of metadata about the folder structures and so on. So eventually later, when you create, uh, like what, run any query involving uh, the partition uh, folders or uh, partition columns here, think it will be fast. Spark will know where to look, look for the data quickly and he doesn't, it doesn't need to go and uh, enumerate the whole file system. So let's go and have a look on this one. Done, in less than a second. Second. So this one, the main difference here, I'm using that kind of external table thing instead of uh, referencing the file system directly, okay? So this is the second uh, tip here, depending on, uh, try to understand the underlying file system in your application and whether you need uh, this kind of uh, tweaks or, uh, uh, additions to your applications 
because uh, if not, if you have a soft file system or a deep partition server, you might have stuff like this in, in your Spark uh, history. Uh, things that look fast, but actually duration-wise, it will be very slow. Okay, very good. So we have a little bit more understanding now around file system and what what uh, what the impacts it can have on your application. Let's go to the next one. It's more about maybe sport and gems here. So normally, if you go to the gem and uh, pick up a couple of dumbbells, uh, dumbbells to play with, uh, you will uh, pick dumbbells with identical weight. I'm not expecting that you will pick a uh, 20 kilograms and a 15. It will be weird. So the same concept applies for big data applications. Try to make things uh, balanced and even. So if you have, most of the time you'll have a cluster with multiple nodes. So try to distribute your compute uh, across all the nodes. Don't have like what, um, uh, two nodes running and 10 nodes just idle waiting for something. All right. The same applies for storage. It's better to have your files with even uh, size. So don't have for the same data set because for biggest applications, files are generated in partitions and uh, every node will generate one part or one file. So it's uh, mainly preferred to have files with a very similar size or even size. Because big data applications are normally uh, executed in, on distributed systems. So if things are fair, compute and storage, uh, the application will uh, run smoothly. Otherwise, it will be, there will be problems and timeouts and slowness. All right, let's go and have a look. Where are we now? So I'll quit this demo and switch to the next one. It's about skewness. So here. Kind of spark shell. So I have some table stored somewhere. Okay. Contains some, some data, some special information. And okay. So this is the table. Just scroll up. Contains some information, state column. Some other like what uh, information from uh, ABS, Australian Bureau, uh, Bureau of Statistics. All right, and I'd like to filter that table. Uh, pick a certain SA4 thing, column, and generate four files. The outcome, or the final uh, outcome, should contain four files and write it to some location. Okay, so we can do it in Spark using two um, APIs. One of them is called Coalesce. One of them is called Repartition. There is a little bit uh, more detail about those APIs, but I'll give you an idea about the effect or the difference in picking which API to satisfy your requirement. So let's run the QLS. You can see here that Spark is running four tasks. So generally speaking, if you use a, an API like this one, you will use four tasks or four threads among your um, cluster nodes. I have um, what, a 12 core laptop now. So it is not even consuming all the compute I'm, I have on my laptop, okay? Eventually it will finish, but yeah, because it is, it is not consuming all the compute I have, it will be somehow slow. The next one, meanwhile, okay, can, can imagine it is slow now, yeah. Okay, done. The next one, using a different API. You can see here it is, Spark is creating like 40 tasks. So if I open my task manager now, it looks like what it will uh, deviate from the uh, explanation thread here. You will find that got most of the cores, like the 12 cores or something are already running. And these are number of completed jobs and this number of completed, sorry, tasks and active tasks. Okay, so this was supposed to be uh, faster. I'll go now and do the same here, refresh. So the first one, which was using a coalesce API, took 37 seconds. The second one, and it was using like what? Yeah, four threads only, or uh, spawning four tasks. The second one, which was using uh, a repartition API, yeah, created much more tasks and finished quickly. All right. So the idea is that uh, depending on the API you select in your application, you might limit the processing. Uh, on your cluster, cluster to a few nodes or machines, all right? Which is not good, actually. Think about this kind of example if you are uh, processing um, terabytes of data. So instead of this kind of uh, slight difference here between uh, 37 seconds and 20 seconds, 
there will be um, quite a difference between five minutes and five days, all right? So one other thing other than the uh, distributing compute evenly among the nodes of the cluster, let's have a look on the file system now. So the two APIs created their outcome in this kind of folders, one data coalesce and one data repartition. So have a look on the outcome for files. The rest of the files are uh, uh, markers and CRCs. So the coalesce one created two files with 3.8 megs and 1.9 megs. Not too bad, but yeah, two files are roughly half the size of the other files, which is not balancing, okay? Let's go to the repartition thing. I hope you can see my file system small font here. I think it's obvious here. Look at this one. So this one is fairly identical size, or roughly identical size. So the good thing about the other API, or I'll go back here. This one, this API will distribute load uh, more evenly among cluster nodes, and it will also produce files with somehow uh, identical size, which is also good. It will include a little bit more um, shuffling across uh, cluster nodes, but eventually you will pay a little bit more compute for much more faster and uh, better uh, outcomes, all right? So this idea was around, or this tip was around making things balanced compute-wise and storage-wise so that your, your applications and jobs will run smoothly and consistently. Back to the presentation. Okay, so next one, it's more about data quality. So uh, in classic web applications or desktop applications or whatever, we have unit tests or integration tests as well and so on. And the same applies for big data. Yeah, you can pick whatever um, preferred library in Spark or whatever tool you use and do unit tests before you uh, push your code to whatever environment. But in big data applications, there is another aspect to consider, which is data quality. I mean, on a uh, Web application, for example, the outcome is a screen or some sort of an inter interaction between the user and the application. But the outcome of a big data application or a pipeline is a, a piece of uh, data stored on a file system that can be like what consumed uh, one year from now or something like that. And then you need to make sure that the outcome of that job is kind of um, acceptable and okay. Think about it. Uh, the basic idea is like if you have a, a unique column, it should, it should be unique. It should, if you have a column that is uh, supposed to contain positive numbers only, it shouldn't have negative numbers and so on. So it's also uh, recommended here to apply this kind of data quality checks, probably at the end of the pipe of your pipeline. And also you can apply it at the beginning to capture any like what uh, problems with your input data if you need. And for sure, this kind of pipelines are composed of uh, multiple steps and uh, it's uh, also recommended to add as much diagnostics and logging as uh, needed so that you can track uh, the problems later. And for sure, there might be some notifications needed in case uh, a job fails or whatever, then you need to identify someone to have a look. Cool. Let's go and close this one. I'll do some data quality stuff now. No magic, but the idea of how to apply that such things to a big data application. Oops. All right, we'll go to data quality. So what do we have here? All right. Uh, I'm using, or I, I'll start Spark Shell uh, using what? With some sort of a dependency, some library that will uh, make it easy to for me to check the quality of a certain data frame. And what I'm going to do, let me just go to that folder first, and then start Spark Shell. And run that snippet. So the example we have here, let's assume we have uh, an order is stable. We'll display now, or actually let's have a look here. So we have an order table or a CSV file containing order information and cell amount and country code. And I have a country lookup, country code name continent. And I'd like to generate some sort of a, a report that will contain 
or the information and country name and continent or region or stuff like that. So I'd like to join the country table with the orders table. Here is the join, where is that? Oh yeah, joining the country, uh, orders table with the country table and showing the first, for example, five records, order ID, stuff, and plus uh, the joint country, I think. No, this is not. Ah, last one, we click enter. Okay, so yeah, this is the order, inf order information and then this is the joint country information. So what can we do now? We can create some sort of uh, declarative code here that can say, okay, for the final data set generated, I should have an order column which should not have nulls and it should be unique. The country name, there should be a country name column and it should be also uh, does not contain nulls and the set amount should be non-negative, all right? So I'm just creating a small uh, helper method here. To do what? To take a data frame and apply a certain uh, kind of data quality check and return the value, all right? So I run this kind of um, method against my join data frame and see the result of data quality thing. Well, done, okay, success. All the data quality like what constraints are already satisfied and everything is good. Green signal, ship it, all right? Cool. So let's assume that uh, that country table is not managed or uh, owned by your team and comes from a, a third party or another team in your company or whatever. And for any reason, at a certain point of, of time, it contained duplicates, stuff like that. So I'm just simulating duplication here, all right? And joining with that duplication data frame. All right, so if we see here the generated data frame that is supposed to like what, be the output for the duplicate lookup uh, country. What do you have here? Yeah, we have the order ID. I mean, every order is represented here twice. It's kind of quite expected, nothing magic here. All right, so let's run the same stuff, the same verification stuff. Oops. Again, it's a new data frame and boom, we'll get an error, somehow expected for sure. But the idea here is that, yes, you will just encode your expected uh, data quality checks or constraints or whatever, and then make sure that before you write the data frame to desk, run this kind of stuff, it will produce a result, and then based on the result, if there's an error, yeah, you can, there's, the library contains uh, some other APIs to like what print the details, what was the failure, is it uh, uh, the order ID column or the country column or whatever, and then you can persist this kind of uh, results, send an email or fail the job up to you. Okay, and by the way, I forgot to mention that uh, the library is called DQ, it's from AWS, okay? So yeah, the idea here is that, uh, I mean, there is no uh, magic or actually a basic idea, garbage in, garbage out. So make sure that you don't produce garbage out. All right, cool. Next one. And we'll have a look on governance. All right, it's a boring thing, but I'll try to make it somehow exciting. All right, governance. So uh, related to uh, working with big data, most of the time you'll be working with a, a big enterprise and there might be some sort of compliance or requirement, or sorry, governance requirements and so on, security, it's kind of quite expected. So you need to have an asset catalog, you need to have a tool. It's not enough to like what, create a, a small uh, Excel sheet or whatever to manage your uh, artifacts and data sets it will go out of control very quickly. And then you need to have some sort of lineage for each data set generated in your system. You need to understand from where it originated, what was the Spark application or version uh, produced it, what are the input data sets, such that, for example, if you have a certain input data set that was identified to be uh, broken or whatever, you will find out using that kind of lineage, what are the impacted uh, data pieces, and then you can go and rebuild them or whatever. You need also to have some sort of classification, sometimes uh, related to this kind of uh, uh, PII or uh, financial classification. So if a data set is to be identified as a confidential or private or whatever, you can find them quickly using a classification or tag. And then based on such classification,
permissions and tagging, you can apply some sort of automatic security. So if a data set is classified as a, a private only or something, you can, or confidential, you can apply a certain rule, uh, rule-based uh, security thing against that data set using um, the common tool in that space is called the Apache Ranger. And yeah, the tool for doing the governance here and lineage is Apache Atlas. There is maybe other tools that you can uh, write your own, but yeah, I mean, just don't reinvent any wheels. Kind of the general recommendation. So let's go to the governance thing. Have a look here with this shell. And what do we have here? So I have a similar kind of query, the same stuff like uh, orders and countries and then joining them and then writing the result to the file system, okay? So uh, I have now switching from my WSL VM. I'll switch to a Docker container containing uh, Spark along with uh, that Apache Atlas project or a product, sorry. So I think it is already open. And by the way, so we have, I mean, just to let you know that it's the same country table, same order table, and I have that um, demo script. I'm using some um, connector from Databricks. It's called the Spark Atlas connector that will make things easy so that you will write your Spark job normally, and then you'll get the lineage uh, created for you without uh, no extra effort from your side. So I'll grab this one. I think I am. I am inside that thing now, uh, that Docker container. So I have a folder called NDC 2020 containing the country CSV, the order CSV, and my demo script. So I hope from, I run Spark and feed it with that demo uh, script. And the rest is like what uh, config files to uh, make uh, or wire up that uh, Spark Atlas connector. So I run that job. Okay, give it a second. Nothing like what uh, very amazing we'll, we'll see in this uh, shell window now, but we'll switch to Atlas uh, screen in a second. Okay, so this is I got uh, the final uh, outcome to be written to the file system and the job completed successfully. Then I'll go here to a browser. Where is the browser? Here is my browser. Okay, so this is a UI of Atlas. Once you log in here, you can go and search for your data set. So let me go. You can search by name, but uh, I had a problem with the name search today, so I'll do another approach. I search for any data type or any data artifact with this type. We have stuff like uh, an HDFS path or uh, piece of data. You have uh, Hive tables. You have other types of artifacts as well. So it should be a file system thing. And I'll go show more data here. So it should be named, I'll search just for NDC 2020. Okay, here we have it. Okay, so we have this, hope I can open it in a new tab. Okay, cool. Good, so we have a data frame here created in the uh, that folder. Actually, if I go back to the shell here, I'll find LS. So we have the original like, what files, and now we have a new folder created containing the outcome data frame. And if we go and have a look on the lineage here, Oops, where is that? There might be a problem in my machine now or something, but yeah, just to imagine, yeah, I think this can happen here. So maybe I can grab the lineage from another data set or whatever, but there was something like what uh, countries as a node and um, what else? Um, orders as a node and then connected to a Spark application and the outcome will be uh, this kind of data frame, okay? And then related to the classification, let's, let me go and go to NDC, for example, orders. You remember that the orders, if we have, yeah, stuff like that. So this is 
this is the lineage. I'm not sure it was not showing for the other data set for some reason, but think about it like what the final outcome was kind of uh, composed by two inputs running for a certain, I mean, running through a certain Spark application. But if you remember that order data set, it contains an, uh, a cell amount. Okay, so let me go and create a new classification, maybe. Oops, all right, I can create it here. Uh, sorry. I think I have a, a classification called financial already created. So I just go and, yes, I have a classification called financial. So I'd like to classify this uh, piece of data, which is my input data set as a financial data. Okay, so I'll, I'll apply a financial classification. I can also take propagate such that any data set that was uh, kind of linked or produced via the orders data set will also be marked financial, all right? So I'm applying that classification now and propagating it as well. So yeah, just uh, my apologies because yeah, single laptops, not real, a real cluster. So if you wait a few seconds, but while waiting, it should finish now. The same idea applies, I mean, if we run the same job once again, uh, because the input data is marked as financial, uh, if we run the job once again and produce uh, a new data set in another folder, the new folder will be marked also as financial. All right, so maybe we can go to the other window and refresh it with something. Okay, so this, this was the output data set, and you can see here that I, I think the other one should have finished, but maybe the UI is, is stuck or something. So this data set is marked now uh, financial because it's a, a propagated classification. And then you can use such classifications and tags to apply security uh, automatically. So anything that is uh, classified financial is allowed only by the finance department and stuff like that. Okay, and yeah, Ooh, seems to be uh, some sort of uh, a lag, some uh, stuff happening in the background, but this is the lineage, lineage idea. We have the country's data set, we have the order data set running through a certain Spark application named XYZ, and then producing my outcome data set, okay? So yeah, this kind of tool will make uh, your life easy, especially if you have um, too many data sets and you would need to track them and uh, apply certain kind of custom security uh, policies. All right, so that was about the governance and how to make things a little bit more exciting. Back to the presentation. All right, yep, okay, good for the time. Final piece here, tooling. So, I mean, tooling will help you uh, make your daily development uh, experience uh, enjoyable and, yeah, um, make a little bit of other things run faster as well. So let me give you an idea here. Most of the big data uh, kind of workloads will start first with interactive queries. So think about it like 70 or 80% of your time will be running inside something like uh, Zeppelin or Jupyter and writing uh, a bunch of interactive queries and sharing your findings with your team. So we'd like to have uh, something very, very good related to interactive queries and how to handle them uh, related to stuff like source control integration and diffing uh, notebooks and how to where to store notebooks. And also, sometimes uh, if you have a big problem, it's better to uh, divide and conquer the problem so that you will uh, divide it into small pieces and keep one notebook for each small problem and then you pipeline them and run them. I mean, once you are done with each individual problem, run them in a pipeline. And having a tool that will allow you to do a notebook pipelining will be also very appreciated. And finally, uh, most of the time, you'd like to have uh, a local experience plus cloud integration. To elaborate that, I mean, look at experiences that you can try stuff, uh, ideas, or uh, concepts locally, or even small, uh, small big data workloads on your machine. But still, once you are done with your uh, uh, script or interactive notebook or whatever, again, a subset of the data or whatever, you can take it, uh, the same notebook, the same script, and push it to the cloud, run it on a Spark, on a Kubernetes cluster, stuff like that. Okay, so we need to have the same tools that can do stuff like that. And uh, recently, we have tools like Kubeflow, we have um, uh, Spark Magic, and I'll do a demo using a tool called Elira. Okay, so where is that tool? I'm just switching to my container list here. 
I have a container running containing this kind of tool. It's from GitHub. You can just go and um, uh, it's an extension on top of Jupyter and Jupyter Lab. So you can just install it locally or install it inside uh, a container. And then once you install it, you'll have interface like this, okay? Very similar to Jupyter, but the main thing that I'd like to uh, show here are source control integration. So I have the repo for the all the stuff from um, this talk in some GitHub um, repo, and uh, uh, the link is uh, shared already in Slack. But I mean, I have went to this um, Docker container and get clone repository, and then boom, I have the repository here. And then you can even like what pull latest changes and do the same. I mean, I think we have a very uh, basic kind of Git client here so that you can do commits, uh, push, merge, everything roughly, and diff as well. And I'll show you the diff uh, from the browser. You don't need any other tools. So uh, let me show, switch to the tooling folder. I have a couple of notebooks here. They are like what for a basic uh, machine learning uh, uh, scenario, kind of hello world using a, a data set called Iris Flowers, all right? So yeah, I'm showing here the example of uh, divide and conquer and maybe uh, separating uh, stuff across multiple notebooks. So I have one notebook for downloading data and maybe uh, printing some sort of, uh, or doing some sort of exploratory analysis, all right? And another notebook for pulling this data from the local file system and doing some sort of uh, machine learning, decision tree classifier, I mean, this kind of example, you will find it, uh, grab the code from anywhere like uh, Kaggle or else, um, yeah, scikit-learn, stuff like that. So uh, this, this type of code is uh, very, very common everywhere. Pulling data, doing exploratory analysis, and then uh, doing the machine learning or whatever later. And actually I'm deviating from, from Spark and Hadoop here, uh, although we still have the same concepts there, especially if you are doing uh, machine learning using Spark, all right? So I have the first notebook here. I can go and uh, run all cells, all right? So I'm just like what, assuming I'm, I'm having this kind of branch or code base from uh, a teammate and I'd like to run it and see what's happening. Okay, it's running, a new file has been downloaded here, data, data.csv. And yeah, we have some sort of, um, what they call it here, pair plot to identify the correlations between different variables or features inside your data set, which is cool, okay? I'll save this one. I'll go to the next notebook. I run the machine learning thing and it will produce some sort of an accuracy metric, I think, okay? Cool. So this is like a classic uh, scikit-learn stuff. I'll do the same. It's pulling data now from the local file system because it has been uh, maybe downloaded and maybe prepared or tweaked using a previous notebook. Okay, it's done now, but we have an accuracy of like what, 0.9, I mean 91%. Assume that, okay, I got this code from uh, a teammate and I know a little bit more than him uh, about decision tree, trees and machine learning. So I know that, yeah, if you just, maybe for this case, maybe he didn't um, notice, but if you increase the depth to three or something, I mean, for sure not to introduce overfitting, but let's like what do the training again, but with a, a depth of three instead of two. Okay, boom. Going to 98% now, which is amazing. Cool, so I can save this notebook, maybe create a branch or whatever, and then uh, push my changes so that uh, the other team members can review and uh, maybe merge to master or whatever. And let's have a look on the get um, section here. So it has been kind of very common that, yeah, diffing uh, Jupyter notebooks or Zeppelin or whatever is a very uh, unpleasant experience due to the JSON storage format on, of such notebooks. But we have tools like uh, Elira and uh, some other extensions uh, behind it doing quite good diff. So let me go to this one and maybe not double click, but right click diff. Okay. And you can see there are a bunch of differences here, but if you can just ignore this one because this is about uh, download time stems and stuff like that. But other than that, I mean, this kind of notebook, nothing changes. So the output changes, this is kind of metadata, like what when the cell has been executed and the timing. 
But if I go to the second notebook, because the second notebook I have done a code change, really, a real code change. So I go to dev here. If you have a look here, you'll find that, okay, that, okay, I can zoom in so that you can see it easily. Grab this one. So we have max depth here. The original value was two and the new value was three. Okay, this is a code change. And even the output, if the output was kind of changed and uh, other than the execution timeouts and this kind of stuff, I think you can understand, okay, it was 91% accuracy and now, oops, it's 98. All right, so I can like what, create a commit or something, do something and commit it in a branch or stuff and then push it for other people to review and this kind of things. So yeah, the tool will make, uh, make this kind of workflows very easy and pleasant. And finally, you know, I don't have to do it, but I think there is also option to run stuff locally in a pipeline. So I have prepared some pipeline before. So running, uh, actually you can just drag a notebook like this one and then run it in a pipeline, connect stuff together. So I'll delete this one. So I'm running the part one of the workflow and connect it to part two. I can run this stuff locally or in the cloud. I mean, can run locally in some sort of uh, a container using uh, pandas and stuff or whatever docker image you would like to run it against or you can push it to kubeflow and run it in a spark environment and kubernetes all right so yeah um, whatever the tool you are going to use uh, make sure that it will satisfy this kind of requirements and uh, it will make your development experience enjoyable and fast as well and yeah I, also the collaboration should be key here all right, we don't have to run this one. It's just clicking buttons and uh, monitoring things running, but you can imagine uh, all these kind of features and the, their value. So tooling, I, I think we have good tools here. And yeah, if you are doing Spark, there is a Spark magic so that you can connect remotely via a product called Levy. And uh, for stuff in the cloud, we have Kubeflow, which is available in Azure and AWS, and maybe Google as well. And Yes, that's it. I think we still have like what, 10 minutes for questions or feedback or whatever. And I, have, I hope you have learned uh, one or two things uh, on how to efficiently develop and uh, manage and operate your uh, big data pipelines and applications. Uh, or maybe even if you are not using Spark or Hadoop, maybe some of the concepts here are applicable to other uh, tools as well. And thank you so much for having me today. I'm very uh, glad to share this kind of information with you. Uh, the code, uh, the repo for the demos and presentation is available on GitHub, and I've uh, left a link in uh, what, in channel, room five. Yeah, and I'm happy to take uh, some questions here or in Slack. We still have seven minutes. And